Now please welcome Apostle Jeff Inglehart as he continues our new series entitled All In, Giving Your All for Christ. Hey, good morning. Good to see each and every one of you today. And, um, you know, j- just before we begin this morning, I want to, last week was, was a good service, amen? And um, it, come on up here, Re- uh, Renee. I've, I want Renee to share something. In discipleship class, the Lord had given her word last Sunday, and, um, and she was seeing some things that were happening, and, and uh, of course, she has a prophetic mantle on her life, and, and I just want her to share. This is Renee Jenkins, and she does our discipleship class on Monday night. And uh, it's been quite a class. It was only supposed to go for 12 weeks, and we're into our 20th, 21st, no, I'm No, it's been good. It's been really good. Sh- share with us this morning that word. You want, you need the, yes, put it right here. Last week when we were in worship, uh, the Lord showed me something. I seen a stage of a football field, and I'm not that sporty type. So I wasn't thinking of the Super Bowl that's coming up, but I know the opposing team goes one way, defense goes another way. (laughs) I've never watched a game all the way through, but I'm going to watch it this year. And anyways, while we were in worship, I seen a football field, and on the field, there was a release of the angelic hosts of God onto the field. And they began to tackle and they began to take down our opposing enemy. And I've seen how red in the face that the church has been that's been exhausted from digging in and holding our ground. We were holding every inch of that field. But now, said the Lord, you will see a win. You have to see a win. And he kept saying, you have to see a win and you will see a win. You will see a goal and you will move forward. And you will know the victory of the Lord. How do they do those victory dances? It's time we get our praise on. Because God will not fail us. Those who hope in the Lord will not be disappointed. It is written. We have victory. And we are moving forward. Forward. Stand up. I want to read over something. I want to read the scripture over you as it is written. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you all along the way and to bring you to the place which I have prepared for you. The angel of the Lord, he is a guard. He surrounds and he defends all those who fear him. I will cover you with my feathers. (laughs) Mm. And under my wings you will find refuge. My faithfulness shall be your shield. And my truth shall be your buckler. Says the word of the Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. Can I have that? I'll I'll, I'll give it back to you, but can I have that for a minute? Thank you. I want you to know that uh, God's always up to something. He's just waiting for you to catch up. How many know I'm talking about? The Bible says he goes before us to make our way prosperous. How many know that? He's already gone way before you because he's planning things out for your life. And that doesn't mean that everything is easy to get there. It means that he's promised you promises along the way. And as you claim those promises, if you're standing on those promises, you're going to see the goodness of God in your life. Amen? 
Well, thank you for joining me this morning, and those that have tuned in as well, we're really glad that you're here, and uh, we're continuing our series about All In. Renee, when I saw you do that dance, I said, man, she is getting all in. <laughs> She's getting all in. And uh, we, we want to look at a story this morning, and it's a familiar story to many of us. It's about the woman with the issue of blood. I, you know, it was one of those things that I, I, I wrote two other sermons for today and the Lord kept bringing me back to the woman with the issue of blood I said Lord we all know the story about the woman with the issue of blood and he says I want you to go back it over again and as I was going back over it again there's some things that I really think that God wants to show us and reveal to us about how she had to go all in how she had to go all in. So let, let's read that this morning. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn there with me this morning, or your smartphones, you can open that up as well. It's in, chapter, it's in Luke chapter 8, verses 43 through 48. It reads this. It says, A woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and could not be healed by anyone came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, and immediately her hemorrhaging stopped. And Jesus said, Who is the one that touched me? And while they were all denying it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding around, pressing on you. But Jesus said, Someone did touch me, for I was aware that power had gone out of me. When the woman saw that they, she had not escaped notice, she came trembling and fell down before him and declared in his presence of all the people and the reason why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. You know, in this very familiar story, we have a woman who has been bleeding for 12 years, and she spent all, the Bible says she spent all of her money on these doctors. But one of the things that, that, that we in the Western culture, we don't realize that she was under a Levitical law. And the Levitical law said that she can't be by her husband, she can't be by her children, she can't be by her neighbors, she can't, be, she can't be by her friends, she can't go to synagogue, she can't do anything, she has to separate and be unto herself for 12 years. Does anyone remember the COVID experience? Uh-huh. Being separated, how many know being separated is not good for you? Oh, being alone, we're doing it together. No, we're not doing anything together, we're alone. You know what I'm saying? And it's amazing that my family lived to tell the stories about COVID. That's all I can say. Because God never intended all of us to be together that long. You know what I mean? But no, I'm just kidding. But I will say this, when you're separated, there's something that happens in the separation. And can you imagine being, can you imagine COVID lasting for 12 years? That's what it was like for this, for this woman. She was alone for 12 years. If you, if you want to research this, you can do this on your own time. It's in Leviticus chapter 15, verses 19 through 33, and it gives the Levitical law on what she's supposed to do and how she's not supposed to touch anybody. If she touches somebody, they become unclean. And they got to go through a washing and a purification, and it takes, it takes time out of their day as well, and it's, it's just this whole long thing. But So it, it declared that she was unclean, and she had to separate from all these people. The woman, the wo- this woman heard about Jesus and made a decision in her heart. She made a decision in her heart. And this was her last chance. This was her last chance. She's been to all these physicians. And Luke, being a physician, he knows what this woman's going through. He knows the law, but he also understands what this woman's going through because he said it's uncurable. He totally gets it. And some of you are here today because you once had an encounter with Jesus Christ because you also felt like hopelessness. You also felt like you were at the end of your rope. Some of you have, have known, known cancer and been healed of cancer. Praise God. Some of you have known other diseases and been healed of other diseases. Some of you have been, have been healed from from the the grips and the vices of alcoholism and drug addiction. And it's when you feel like you're at that last hope that you just you just have to strive, you've got to press in a little bit more just to just to reach out, just to grasp Jesus. It was in that last hope that she was feeling. 
she had to make a decision. So if you're taking notes this morning, I hope you are because that's how you apply things to your life. You can even take your smartphone and take a picture of the slide. But this is what it is. Number one, to be all in means you must make a decision. She was making a decision that day. She was making a decision in her her mind. Do I go where there's other people when I'm told that I'm not supposed to be there? How many know that if you're dying and you want to be healed, you press in, you do whatever you need to do, even if the law says you're not supposed to be doing it? Do you know what I'm saying? Because it is a matter of life or death. It's a situation of life or death. Her first response to the bleeding was to go to a physician, which many of us would would also do, but the first physician could not help her. The second, the third, the fourth, over 12 years of going to physicians and spending all the money she had could not help her. And this is the amazing thing. She knew Jesus was coming. She knew Jesus was coming. And so she did. She pressed in. Finally, after 12 years, she heard about Jesus, and she knew that there would be many people crowding around him that day, but she would have a small chance, maybe not to talk to him, maybe not to go up and ask for prayer, but maybe if she could just touch the hem of his garment, she knew she would be made whole. You see, once you make the decision in your life, once you make that decision in your heart, then number two is this, then you believed. She went from making the decision and the choice to believing, to believing that if she just touched the hem of his garment, she would be made whole. She would have heard the story of Jesus' birth when, when, you know, when, uh, and she would have known that with God, all things are possible. She would have heard about Lazarus being raised from the dead. She would have heard about Jesus doing all these signs, wonders, and miracles wherever he was going. And so she's like, I've got to get to him. I've got to reach out to him. And in Numbers chapter 15, 38 through 40, and also Deuteronomy 22 through 12, God had commanded the Jews to wear fringes on their tassels, on their, on their tents, which is their prayer shawl. And the amazing thing about these prayer shawls is that there's these deceits or talits that are hanging down from each corner of the prayer shawl. And she didn't touch the hem of his garment at his feet. She reached out to touch the anointing, which was around his neck that was hanging down from him. She reached out to touch the, that hem of his garment. Because she knew if I could just reach out to the anointing, I could be healed. If I could just reach out, if I could just extend enough to his anointing, I would be set free. I'd be made whole. The amazing thing about this is the Jews believe that there were 613 commands in the law. Can you imagine having to follow 613 commands? I don't know about you, but I'm glad I'm not under the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. I'm glad I'm living in the New Testament under the New Covenant, and the law is love. That's what Jesus says. He says, that's great, all those things are wonderful, but I give you a new. A new replaces the old. He didn't say another. He said, I don't give you another command. He said, I give you a new command, and that's to love. So love replaces 613 other laws. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? And so 613 threads represent God's word, and they're each intertwined in these talits on the edge of the prayer shawl. Each tassel contained a blue thread, which represented God's power and his authority, intertwined in these 613 threads. And when Jesus walked, when he had that on and he walked, and when any Jewish man or rabbi or uh, all the Jewish men would wear them and as they'd walk they would see these 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 talits fly out in front of them they'd see this prayer shawl come out in front of them I wish I had my prayer shawl it's in storage we need a building so I get my props out you know what I mean but this prayer shawl every time they'd walk they'd see this they'd see this prayer shawl just swing out in front of them they'd see the talits walk out in front of them and they'd say oh there's the power of God oh there's the commands I'm keeping And as long as I follow the commands of God, I'm going to walk in the power of God. I'm going to strive. I'm going to live in the anointing of God. And every time they'd see those things fly out in front of them like wings, 
You've got to hang on to that like wings. He, they would say, there's something that's different. There's something that's there. There's something, and I need to reach out. She said, I need to reach out and touch that because that is the power and the authority of God. As she gets close to Jesus and saw these tassels and these fringes swinging back and forth, her faith arose. And because she was a Jewish woman, she would know those commands that God had placed in God's word. And in Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, look up here. It says this, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, and you will go free, leaping with joy like calves let out of a pasture. Do you understand that that prayer show that Jesus was wearing, that's what it's talking about, his wings? That's what it's talking about, the healing in his wings. It was the healing that was resided in the prayer shawl that it is as an anointing. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful today we don't have to walk around with the prayer shawl because we have the mantle of God's authority and his anointing already living on the inside of us because the word says that we are his living temples. And he resides on the inside of, he doesn't reside in a building, he resides in people. And his anointing resides in you. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same Holy Spirit that's living on the inside of you. And I like this. Now, if you just heard that word just a moment ago, if you just heard that moment ago from Renee, Renee gave us a prayer out of Exodus 23, 20. Behold, I send angels before you to guard you along the way and to bring you to a place which I have prepared. Psalms 34, 7 says, The angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. But Psalms 91, 4 says this, I will cover you with my feathers and under my wings you will find refuge. That's what it's talking about. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about under my wings. It's talking about the prayer shawl was the wings. And under that wing stood that anointing that was there. That anointing that was there for that woman to reach out and to press in and to grab a hold of that anointing in her life. So she'd be healed. So what was she saying in her mind? She was saying, Lord, I'm reminding you of the promises you have made us. And I believe that I am made whole. This is what Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 through 5. And she would know this scripture. She would know the scripture as a good Jewish woman. She would have known Isaiah 53 verses 4 through 5. It says, surely he hath borne our griefs and he had carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him. And by his stripes... We are healed. You see, this was a picture. This was the Isaiah was a prophet declaring what Jesus was going to be. He was declaring this is the Messiah. This is what the Messiah is going to be like. These are the attributes the Messiah is going to have. And here Jesus shows up and she's saying, I believe that you are the Messiah. And I've got to reach out and touch just the hem of your garment and I know I'll be healed. How incredible. She made the decision. She believed it would work. And then number three, she acted upon her belief. As she touched the fringe and the tassels, she reminded that Jesus of his word, she's touching that very anointing. You see, the difference is today for us is that we don't have to touch a hem of a garment because we're clothed in his garment. Did you know that this morning when we sang that song, I saw the Lord, he was high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple? Do you know that his train of his robe, the length of a, of a king's robe would, would declare their wealth and their provision? And it says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train of his robe filled the temple. That means that, that God's provision for you and for me is limitless. The train of his robe filled the temple. His provision for you is limitless. And now today when I am feeling, you know, this morning I woke up with the beginnings of a migraine and I started praying for specific people in the congregation that I know that, that deal with that. And, and as, I was, and I, as I, was, I was like, oh devil, not today. You, you know, I, I know you know the word that I'm going to bring forth, and not today. You're not going to have this because I'm going to declare the promises of God over my life. By his stripes, I have been made whole. 
By his stripes, I have been made whole. See, it's not, it's not that we have to remind God of his promises now. Now you have to remind the enemy to take your hands off of you because it's your right to be whole. Do you understand that? Before the cross and before the resurrection ever happened, before Jesus ever resurrected, people needed Jesus. They needed what he had and what he brought. After the cross, after after the, the, you know, the tomb, after he, he rose from the tomb, after he rose from the dead. Now it's, yes, we need what Jesus has, but Jesus freely gives it to us. And he, puts, he places it in us by the person of the Holy Spirit. And so now we have that knowledge in us. And we say, you know what? Not today, devil. These are my promises. These are my promises. Get out. Now, I hope that you're not that person that was on the receiving end ever of an eviction notice. But if, if you've ever seen an eviction notice, it means you have to vacate the premises. You have to vacate the premises. Every time you, God, you speak God's word over your life, every time you declare from your mouth God's word, you're giving eviction notice to the enemy that's trying to rob, steal, and destroy you. That's trying to come into your mind. That's trying to, to bring you brain fog. That's trying to you know, hinder you, hamper you with illnesses and sicknesses and diseases. All those things that are trying to hamper you, those are all from the enemy. They're not from God. And you're God's child. And all we have to say is, not today. And you serve the eviction notice to the enemy off your life. Come on. You have to serve the eviction notice off of your life so that you don't get caught into those things. She acted on her belief. She acted on her belief. As she's touched the fringes and the tassels, she received that healing. And the Bible says that Jesus' compassion stirred within him. As he felt the virtue leave him, he knew that, he, that she was the one that had touched him. But he said to her, who touched me? And Peter looks at Jesus and says, are you kidding me? There's all these people all around. And if you've ever been in the, in the streets, in the narrow streets of, of the old city of Jerusalem, they're very narrow. You can get one car down them, Maybe. And so can you imagine the people that were lined on the sides and were parting as Jesus was coming down and through and the crowd was pushing in trying to see him and trying to be around him. And yet she stayed in one spot and she just waited till he came by and then she reached out and grabbed that anointing, that healing, and she appropriated it to her life. You see, he turned and requested make herself known there was something more to be done. See, Jesus doesn't just leave us in one state, but also according to the law, the Levitical law, that she'd have to go to a, she'd have to go to a rabbi, she'd have to go to a priest to get, to get a clean bill of health, to be able to go back and be restored back to health and, and back to community and back to her husband and back to her children, back to her friends, back to her neighbors, back to her relatives. I mean, she had to get this clear, clean bill of health. And so that's why Jesus said, who touched me? He wanted to publicly reaffirm who she is. Although this woman was seeking Jesus, Jesus was also seeking her. Think about that. As she was seeking Jesus, Jesus was seeking her. He had a plan for her life. Just as he does every one of our lives. He wanted her to confess it. Not hide what she had done but he wanted the crowd around her. Those who were the, those were the ones that, were, that would cast her out as unclean, unfit, polluted, not good enough. And to know that once again she was clean, made whole, made holy, healed physically as well as spiritually. He wasn't putting blame on her. He was encouraging her to step forward so he could confirm her cure. To confirm her cure. That's why I say number four is this. Don't let others hold you back. Don't let other people hold you back from getting all in with Jesus Christ. 
You've got to press through those things. You've got to push sometimes through the crowd that's going one way. You know, I heard a long time ago, if, if all the crowd's running one way, you should probably think about going the opposite. Because God always has a plan. He always has, a, he always has something that's percolating. And I've realized this about the world. If the world's going in one direction, I probably need to turn and go the opposite direction. Because I'm not a follower of the things of the world. I'm a follower of Christ. Did you hear me? We're followers of Christ. Don't let others hold you back. Secret sins are known to Jesus, but so are acts of faith. Matter of fact, the Bible says that it is faith that moves God. It's your faith that moves God. Huh. If you wonder why, wonder why things aren't happening, check your faith. Check your faith. Because it's your faith that moves God. Mark chapter 5 verse 33 says this, But the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him the truth. And then I like this. You see, we went from Luke to Mark because Mark also tells another angle of the story that I want to bring out. It says, Jesus responded and said, Your faith has made you whole. Your faith. Everyone say, Your faith. Your faith has made you whole. It wasn't so much that she reached out just to touch his wing. It wasn't so much that she was reaching out to touch the talits, the tassels on, on his prayer shawl where the anointing was. But he was impressed with her faith. Your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you whole. In the preceding verses, what I think is great about this story is not only it's in Mark, cha uh, Mark chapter 5, 22. And the amazing thing about the way that Mark puts the story is Jesus was on his way to Jairus' house. Now, some of you remember from the Passion Play, we had, we had that one time. Jairus was, a, was an upright man who worked in the temple. And Jairus, he was being torn from what the temple leaders were telling him. Stay away from him. He's a bad man. He's, he's going to destroy our our. our our denomination, he's going he's gonna to destroy our culture, our customs. Stay away from that man, just he's no good. And uh, Jairus presses in because his little girl, his teenage daughter is very ill at home. And he presses in to see Jesus and he comes and talks to Jesus and says, Jesus, my daughter is dying. Will you come? And he said, I'll come. And all of a sudden on his hurried way to Jairus' house, Going through the crowd, all of a sudden this woman interrupts everything, so it seems. She interrupts everything and take, turns the attention from Jairus' dying daughter onto herself. But she too was dying. Can you imagine Jairus, the father, can you imagine him like, what are we stopping for? What's taking so much time? Oh my goodness, he just asked who touched him. We're going to be here for another hour, but my daughter doesn't have an hour. Think about a daddy's heart. He wants to get his daughter well. He wants to get her healed. He's going beyond the customs and the culture of his day. He's going beyond those priests that he works with. It might even cost him his job. And yet he's all in to reach out to the master to get his attention, to say, I need you. I need what you have for my daughter. While Jesus talks with this woman with the issue of blood and he says, your faith has made you whole. While that's happening over here, all of a sudden someone comes running from the direction they're heading to and they come to Jairus and they say, Jairus, your daughter, she's died. And immediately he falls apart because the dad's heart is like, I'm too late. But I like what Jesus does. Jesus turns to him and says, just 
believe. Just believe. Jesus is talking with this lady here that's on the ground, restoring her. The bad news comes. Jairus is feeling it, and all of a sudden he just turns to Jairus and looks at him and says, Just believe. Just believe. What he was, what he was doing is he was saying, Look at her. Look at her example. Just believe. What the rest of the story tells us, that, and that brings me to this last point, is this. When you go all in for Christ, it stirs other people's faith to go all in and to begin to believe. When you're sold out, when you're all in for Christ, you're going to see other people around you start getting all in for Christ. There's something about your faith it does something. It ignites somebody others, someone else's faith to believe. How many of you ever heard family members or friends since you since you've been attending the embassy or, or whenever you got whenever you gave your life to Christ? How many ever heard your friends or coworkers or or family members say there's something that's different about you? Come on. Have you ever heard someone say that to you after you gave your life to Christ? There's something that's different about you. What changed in you? If they haven't been able to say that to you, something's wrong. Dig in with your faith. Go all in so they can see God's glory in your life. So they can see your faith. They can see the faith of the Holy Spirit rising up on the inside of you. So you can mix that. So you can receive all that God has for you. And don't sit back in the crowd but press forward to say, I want to be all in. I want to, I want to reach into that anointing. God, I want your anointing. God, I want for our, our city. I want for our region. I want for our nation. I want, to see a, I want to see a shaking happen that there is so many people. We want to see the glory of God manifest in Bay City, Michigan. We want to see the glory of God go from Bay City, Michigan, up to Standish, Michigan, up to Alpena, Michigan, over, I mean, all Gray, Michigan. We want to see the glory of God go over to Sterling. We want to see it go to Auburn. We want to see it to Midland. We want to see it go all the way on the other side of the state, up to Traverse City, downstate, down Detroit, Grand Rapids. We want to see God's glory just manifested all over our state. But not just our state. We want to see it go over the country and over the country all over the world. Because let's face it. We need a wake-up call. We need the Holy Spirit back in power. If the Word says that, you know what? Signs and wonders shall follow them that believe. Then signs and wonders should be following your life because you're a believer. That means when you pray for someone, He heals them. Did you hear what I just said? God wants to do something in your life. But if you're holding back, if you're saying, no, I just want to be part of the crowd... You'll never receive the blessing. You'll never receive the healing. You'll never receive the manifestation of what God wants to do in your life. You'll never see the purpose that God has for your life. If you're holding back, get out from the crowd. Move in. Press in and say, God, I want you. I want you. Because the truth of the matter is you have all of God that you want to have of him right now. That's the truth. That means that, you know, if you just continue to do the same thing that you always do, you're always going to get the same results. So what do I need to do differently? What do I need to do to press in a little bit more? For some, it's getting up a little bit earlier in the morning, 10 minutes early. It's getting some of the scriptures and it's getting a prayer in. For some of you, you just got to maximize your time. Start praying while you're in the shower. Huh? Your singing's no good anyhow. No, no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Start, start praying in the shower. Start maximizing that time. I'm just kidding. Get over it. We'll talk about offense in a few weeks, all right? Uh, but uh, it really, you know, start doing the things differently than you've done before. Say, God, I need you more now than I ever needed you before. 
Did you know that in two of, two of our Lutheran Bible colleges and seminaries, there is an outpouring of God's presence and his spirit right now? That, that the, the, the students that are there at, at the college are actually repenting of sin and some are being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's, a, that, that, that's just a taboo thing in the States when it comes to the Lutheran church. They believe in the Holy Spirit. They don't believe in the infilling of the Holy Spirit with the manifestations of speaking in tongues. God is doing something all across our nation, all across our land. And I want us to press in. I want to say, God, we're all in because I want to see it. I want to be in the midst of it. I want to say, God, use me, use us to bring a difference to the community that we live in. I love that I think of Mark. I know that today that we're faced with something that you think is incurable. Some of you are here or some of you are watching online. You think what I have is incurable. It's not incurable. Matter of fact, Mark chapter 9, 23 says, everything is possible for him who believes. With God, all things are possible. Your disease isn't incurable. You just need to go to the right physician. It's curable. Everything in this life that we think one way, God can break through and do something great in your life. The enemy of your soul will say to you in your mind, you'll never make it, you're going to die, you've blown it, you're doomed to failure. But Jesus says in John chapter 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life and they might have it more abundantly. Are you willing to believe and touch the hem of his garment of his word. Are you ready to just press in and say, God, I want to trust you this year like never before. God, I want to press in. I want to know you like I've never known you before. How about this prayer? God, would you take anything that's within me in the recesses of my heart that I've been trying to keep covered up? Would you just reveal those things to me and I give you those things those secret areas of my heart so that you can have all of me. So that you can have all of me. Hmm. You see, as I was getting ready this morning, I heard that some are here with heavy hearts because you've gone through a fence and you keep saying, God, I don't know if I can endure much more. I don't know if I can endure much more. Some of you are here with those heavy hearts, those wounds that have been inflicted on you by friends and by people that you trusted, and you're like, God, I don't know if I can handle much more. I don't know if I can handle much more. And he's saying, I want you to press into me. I want you to press into my anointing. That's the Holy Spirit. In the morning, say, Holy Spirit, I need you today. The Bible says he's our teacher, our comforter, our counselor, our guide. He's the one that's going to take you through life. He's the one that reveals purpose to you. And you say, Jesus, Holy Spirit, I need you today. As our musicians are coming forward today, I want us to give us this. I want to give us this example. You know, when you go to a hotel and you, before you go to a hotel, you get a reservation. Isn't that right? Many of you plan, are good planners. You, you plan way in advance. You get the reservation. You got the reservation for your trip. You're all excited about the reservation. That reservation says that because I've held it with my, with my credit card or, or however you're holding it, that you're assured a room at that hotel once you get there. Isn't that right? And you see, it's that, it's that very thing. That's the same thing it is with God's word. Like I said before, when the devil, when the enemy comes at you, you can say, wait, I have a confirmation in my hand from God's word. Did you just get that? You have a confirmation 
in your hand, which is God's word, that says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. All that rise up against me shall fall. You have a confirmation in your hand that says, I would not have my children wanting or begging for bread. I have a confirmation in my hand that says, I'll bless the work of your hands. I will prosper you. I have a confirmation in my hands that he knows my ending from my beginning. And he's planned out my days. I have a confirmation in my hand that says, by his stripes, I have been made whole. You see, that confirmation of God's word in your hands becomes a confirmation in your spirit. And you begin to declare it and your faith rises. Your faith rises. Being all in means that you reach out to Jesus with a purpose. Not just to be another spectator in the crowd. To go all in means this. You make a decision, you believe, you must act on your belief. Don't let the crowd hold you back. She didn't let the crowd or the circumstances hold her back in life. She pressed in. And the last one is when you go all in, it stirs other people's faith to go all in too. Because Jairus saw what happened to her and saw her faith. She wasn't even supposed to be there. Jairus knew that. Jairus knew that the law condemned her for being there in the crowd. But she came anyhow. She received healing anyhow. And she got a clean bill of health. He didn't just, he just, didn't, he just didn't heal her. He restored her fully. Some of you need restoration in your life today. God wants to do that in your life today. He wants to bring restoration in your life. You're praying for healing, but he wants to do just so much more than just healing in your life and in your heart. He wants to bring restoration. Would you stand with me this morning? Nelson's going to lead us in that last worship song that he led us in moments ago. And I want you to declare how holy God is. I want you to declare how holy he is. And I want you just to press in and say, God, I'm believing, I'm expecting everything you have. Our prayer response team members are going to come down. They're going to be down here to pray with you. And our pastors, they're going to be down here to pray with you as well. They're coming right now. And if you need prayer today, I want you to get all in. I want you to press in. I don't care if you came down for the same thing nine times in a row. I want you to press in until you get it. Huh? I want you to press in and be all in until you receive what you've asked the Holy Spirit for. So as Nelson leads us into that, but before he does, I'm going to give us a prayer of blessing, but I don't want us to move right away. I want us to press in first. And then when you feel released to go, you can do that. So Father, I thank you that you bless us on our coming and you're blessing us on our going out and our lying down and our rising up. Everything we put our hands to this week, God, I thank you that it's blessed. I thank you that we're going to be the people that press in so we can be the faith givers and the faith bearers for other people around us to see other people press in. God, I think we're going to be the ones that press in because we're believing the words of your agreement, the promises of your word, that we're going to stand on those promises. We're going to declare those promises in and through our lives. In Jesus' name. And everybody said.